um, this is going to go live now in one second. And then I'll turn it back over to Eddie. Right. I have here on my screen now, this meeting is being live streamed. I don't have exactly, to do yeah. I so no, you, you're perfect. That means right. we're we're good to go. Um, all right. So welcome everyone um, to the Irish American Heritage Museum on this. Oh, hang on. I always forget to do that. Okay, good. Sorry, I was talking on the other page too. <laughs> so we're delighted to have with us um, one of Ireland's most famous and certainly treasured Shanachie, uh in the country. He's been an author and lecturer and broadcaster for. Uh, longer than he probably cares to remember. And, and I have to share with you that when I was a child in Kerry, he would come to our school. He probably went to schools all over the country uh, telling stories and things. And we used to be on the edge of our seats listening to him because he would tell you about the fairies or maybe about the banshee. And um, absolutely, he was a completely national treasure. He was He's from Brosna or Brosna in County Kerry. It's a little town um, outside of Listowel or a, a bit away from Listowel. And now he is, of course, a long term resident um, in County Clare. He was a teacher, but his big passion in life, I suppose, was going around the country and recording old people uh, and how they told stories and the types of stories that they told. He's very much involved with conservation, both of culture, but also of nature and the land. And one of his big things, a big, huge project that he was involved with a few years ago was the protection and preservation of an ash tree, which, of course, is very sacred in Celtic and Irish um, you know, mythology. Um, they were going to knock it to build a to build a road, and so Eddie is kind of a, a repository for a lot of traditions and stories that we might have lost without him collecting them. So thank you so much, Eddie, for joining us. I'm absolutely delighted to have a, a fellow Kerry man, even though you're now Claire, uh, but I'm delighted to welcome you to the Irish American Heritage Museum in, in Albany, New York. Technically, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, and by the way, I have. Uh... A number of relatives not so far from you in Rochester, New York. Oh, good. I hope they're watching. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Good. And if they don't catch you tonight, we'll email them tomorrow to tell them to tune in. Right. So um, I'm going to take my own spotlight off so that we can look at you. But Eddie, if you would, and we, we were talking during the week, or oh, good, Slauncha, we were oh. talking during the week about um, St. Bridget and the different kind of traditions that are associated with her. And I suppose, interestingly enough, for people that might not know, you know, Bridget is possibly a, a kind of a newer, um, a newer, um, tradition in, in a lot of sense like she was very big of course up in um kildare and other parts of the country but not so much in in kerry really although there is a beautiful saint bridget's well near liscanner there in clare near you so will you just tell us a little bit about saint bridget and, and what you had heard about her from the old people not a mighty lot i have to con i have to confess uh what you will hear about and see are saint bridget's wells mm -hmm. In this parish where I'm living now in Crushin, which is north of Ennis, between Ennis and Gott, uh, we have the next parish to County Galway. Uh, here in this parish, there is among the six blessed wells, one of them is uh, St. Bridget's Well. And you wonder why, because this is a long way from uh, Kildare. But there's a lovely story following this well. And it's one of the more popular wells in the parish because remember, all over Ireland, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blessed wells. Some of them have been forgotten about. And a few of them, not, not too many, are still very popular. Because look, with modern medicines, with the modernization of Ireland in general, uh, such things have fallen out of favor. That are beginning to come back a little bit, but uh, the one that is here in this parish, there's a lovely story following it, and the story is this. Over the well, there's a huge, huge sycamore tree, and it's, no, it's it's huge. You could not get your arms around the, uh, the, the bowl of this tree, and they say that an old man, a beggar man who was blind was travelling the road one time with his stick, with his stick. And somebody told him that, look, this well was a cure for blindness. 
I saw many Irish blessed wells were. So naturally, he decided he'd come to the well. And with this particular well, you had to stay overnight. Some wells were like that. You had to stay overnight for the queue. He did. And he got up the water, crossed his eyes, and said to never pray if necessary. And in the morning, when he awoke, his sight was restored. Now, the poor man, he was a beggar man, he had nothing to leave, but he left his stick. That's all he could afford, you might say, or that's all he had to leave. He didn't need it anymore. He had his sight. He left his stick, stuck it in the ground near the well, and the stick took root. And that is the huge, huge tree we have there today. It must be 90 feet high. And as I say, you can't even get your arms around it. Two people couldn't get their arms around it. Vast tree. But a nice story. And there are so many stories about these wells, except most of them have been lost. I've been looking to hear some of the stories from the old people, but you won't get these stories in books, unless you are lucky enough to hear some of the old people before they died. The stories very often die with them. And Eddie, before we go into another story, can you talk to us about why, what drew you to collecting the stories? Like, did you realise, you know, 30 or 40 years ago that I suppose Ireland was changing and we were starting to lose some of those stories or what about it made you want to collect them? No, for none of those things, for something quite, quite more practical. It was, I was doing my MA in UCG, University College Galway, in phonetics, phonetics, and I had to go out collecting uh, sounds studying people's accents. But I quickly found out that uh, the old people, the old people, what they were saying to me, the stories they were telling me, was a lot more interesting than the, the, the accents themselves. Now, where I first went was my own parish, Drosna in County Kelly. Mm -hmm. My father was a local harness maker. And Palmas makers, just like blacksmiths, all the people had to come to their workshops or the forge. And when they'd be there, of course, they'd be talking about the local news because they'd wait for the job to be done. In my father's case, they'd be waiting for their harness to be fixed, for their leather work to be done, just like in a forge, they'd wait for their horse to be shod. They'd be talking, they'd be chatting, maybe telling stories. My father knew all of them. He pointed out who would be interesting to me. I'll never forget the first man I ever took back in 1975. It was Jack Lee, and I can remember him well. He was the image of Tomas Ochrein from the Blaskets. Mm -hmm. He didn't like him. He lived in a house like him. He still had Irish in Brosna, where there was no Irish spoken in 50, 60 years. Hmm. But he had it. He had it. And I, I remember I was 26 at the time, a young lad who knew nothing. Mm. What, does it, what does a young fellow of 26 know? Nothing. And Jack, I can still remember Jack calling me sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> because of the, the respect he had for your education, I suppose. Yes. And yeah. I, was, I was a kind of a stranger with a tape recorder. Thanks be to God, I had that. I have about 70 hours of Jack now. And I still remember him. I, I, I pray for him. Mm. I still pray for Jack, you know. And his wife, Mary. They were wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. And so many of those people that, that invited me into their houses. Mm -hmm. Remember, in those days, every door was open. There's no doors open in Ireland now. Mm -hmm. No doors open in Ireland now. It's a different world. It's a different Ireland. It's a different place because the world has changed. It's sadly, sadly, Ireland is a reasonably friendly country yet, but not in that way. Not in that way. It was a wonderful place, and they were wonderful generation that all gone. Mm -hmm. The book I'm doing now is about the uh, Mac and Tams. The book, the book is called Military Memories. 
Mm. Would you believe part of it is about a man who met Adolf Hitler? Oh, wow. In was 19- he a, a tan soldier or in the Irish no, army? No. He was. He was. In the American Army, he was he was a grand uncle of a man that I met here in the American Army in 1918. Wow! And of course, he didn't recognise that time. It was only afterwards that he realised who he had met. <laughs> he had been gassed. Oh my God! Yeah. But, but it's going to be an interesting book because I had so many people. I met the, a man who was in Darwin. In the, he was Irish, of course, when mm-hmm. Darwin was bombed by the Japanese in the Second World War. Wow. The, uh, and the Irish were everywhere. Mm-hmm. The Irish were everywhere mm-hmm. in those wars. I had Jack, Jack Donnelly, and as I say, Jack Leahy, that man I, I recorded first. He remembered the Boer War wow. of, of 1899, 1902. Mm-hmm. My, my recordings go back as far as the Boer War. Mm-hmm. The, the Second World War to me is only yesterday. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even bother with that. That's only yesterday. <laughs> so many of the recordings I have are of the First World War. Yeah. An amazing amount of them. And of men who served in the First World War. Yeah. I mean, that's 102 years ago now. Mm-hmm. 103 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and Eddie, with the black and tan book that you're writing, is that based on stories that happened in Clare or Kerry or no, no, no. Kerry, Cork, Kerry, Galway, Mayo, wherever I could get them? Uh, uh-huh. And now I have to say, all of this I never meant to record. They only happened. Luckily, I asked those questions as I was passing. Uh-huh. And the funny, the funny thing was, we always thought of the black and tans as the British out of bastards. Oh, scumbag, the, the dregs of England. And as I was going through the recordings, there weren't. So many people told me about the towns as being not so bad. I even found some stories about them that were decent men. Mm. I, I, I was amazed. Mm. But of course, but of course, and a, a lot of them were pumped and blackguards and all the rest. You know, they were literally from A. To say, mm-hmm. and when it came down to it, they were human beings. A lot of them, all of them nearly, were ex-British soldiers from the First World War, who came back to Ireland or to England, expecting a paradise that they'd be rewarded, having served their country, and they came back to unemployment. Mm-hmm. And then there were lots of ten shillings a day to come to Ireland to suppress the rebels. Wouldn't you take it? If you were only uh, <laughs> being unemployed in England, of course they took it. Mm-hmm. Ten shillings a day all found a huge wage at the time. And then the auxiliaries came, the auxiliaries, they were offered a pound a day, ex ex British officers. That was a vast wage at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, they were a tough bunch. <laughs> I tell you, you wouldn't like to meet them on the road. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I met, I, well, it'll be a strange book, I can, and it won't be a popular book. Mm-hmm. And it'll upset, it'll upset so many people's preconceptions. Mm-hmm. But all I do is give exactly what the people told me in their own words. Mm-hmm. Just like I did with the fairy book, Meet, Meeting the Other Crowd. Mm-hmm. And that book is now in its 17 printing. Wow. That's amazing. And you, can, yeah. and you can get it in Japanese or you can get it in Italian. <laughs> and they use it in Moscow University as a textbook. <laughs> wow. Oh my God, Eddie. So and how in God's name could Irish fairy stories be used in Moscow University? Well, just like they have their fairy stories too, and the Japanese have theirs, and fairy stories are popular all over the world. Mm hmm. And do people, like, do academics from Japan or Moscow call you or, you know, ask you to talk about the stories? Absolutely. I do four or five sessions in University College Cork, for example, every year. And would you believe the best audiences of all are Americans? Mm. Americans. And I don't say that flatteringly now. I, <laughs> I, say that, I say that because, uh, you see, the Irish here 
think, and I have to say this honestly, the Irish too often here think, ah, the Americans will believe anything. They won't. Mm -hmm. I find, I find Americans can be the best audience because they'll ask tough questions and you better know your stuff. <laughs> you, you better know your stuff. Yeah. And I, I pride myself. I always leave 15 minutes a day in the every session of storytelling I do for questions. Mm -hmm. And I ask them, look, question me, ask me any question you like. Mm -hmm. And let them. Because I've been, uh, I've been collecting for 45 years. Mm -hmm. And I hope after 45 years, if I don't know my business, well then, I'm a fool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a fool. Yeah. And, I, and, and anybody can say that to me. I am a fool if, I, <laughs> if I've been collecting for 45 years and I don't know my business. Mm -hmm. I must be. And Eddie, um, I know you said you didn't have any other kind of St. Bridget stories, but could you tell us one about, um, oh, I maybe, <laughs> yeah, tell us what you I know will. about her, yeah, or, and I was, we might come to Biddy Early as well, a famous Clare healer, or well, which? <laughs> St. Bridget's father was Dufok, Dufok, and <laughs> St. Bridget was giving a lot of trouble at home. She was too generous. She was giving away everything they had because that's one of her traits. She was a very, very generous woman. But as a young woman, she was giving away what they had. And eventually the father decided, we have to, we, we have to get rid of her. <laughs> so we have nothing left. So he decided, look, he'd take her to the King of Leinster you know, to, to sarm her out, as we put it. <laughs> and, and he did. He brought her to the King of Leinster's house to see could they teach her any kind of manners. Now, when they came to the King of Leinster's house, no weapons allowed inside. No weapons. So uh, leave your sword outside. So the sword was stuck in the ground at the gate and in the, the father went. And he said to Bridget, I, you mind the chariot. You mind the chariot. So in he went and he discussed business with the king inside about <clears throat> the lady outside. Now, while they were inside discussing Nan's business and I suppose having a drink uh, in the process, uh, you know, yourself, uh, all those <laughs> things. You know, Has oh. to be done too, yep. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we're talking away. A leper came because leprosy was a common enough uh, ailment in Ireland at the time. That's why we have such places in Ireland called Leperstown. Etc. The name still persists. But anyway, uh, this leper came away of Miss Fortune, begging and begging and begging. And uh, Bridget, of course, she looked around and oh, she had nothing on herself, but she looked at her father's sword and said, Oh, it was a fancy thing. Oh, it was a fancy thing. And she said, Oh, look, look, you can have that. <laughs> and the leper was delighted, of course. He never had such a thing in his life and he made off. When he could. Now, of course, the king's daughter, or the, the king's daughter, was looking down at this from the battlements of the fort, and of course, she began, oh, she was admiring this. You know, who was this girl below that was so generous and kindly? But uh, the father came out, and he saw what had happened. God Almighty! He said, "Look, look, what have you done, me? Uh, and and the king's daughter ran down uh, and she explained, she explained, look, look, look at that to the father. And of course, Bridget was ex expecting the worst, but the king said, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. You should be proud of such a girl. She's a credit to you. Well, you wouldn't say that to the father of the folk. You wouldn't say that. A, a, a credit? Look, we have had the Anthony left at home with her. She has everything we have given away. Well, <laughs> you can leave her here. You can leave her here. She's a fine girl. She'll be good company for my daughter. And she was taken in. And the father went home. God, thanks be to God we have got rid of her. And in she went. But the King of Leinster says, look, 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 look. You'll have to watch your way here. Servant girl. And she was giving the, giving the job of minding the cows. Which was another thing she was famous for. Anyway, 
This particular day, she was out minding two or three of the cattle. A couple of miles away, and there's a horrible, wet, misty day, like it is here tonight, wet and misty, just like it was yesterday on St. Bridget's Day here. And this particular man came the way, and he was the, the big farmer of the place, and he got talking to her. And God knows, he says, uh, fine cattle you have there. And uh, he said, no, where will you get feeding for them? Oh, and she said, uh, maybe you might provide me with feeding for them, sir. <laughs> he, he smiled at her, and he said, indeed, I will. Never thinking of course, you know, feeding for a couple of cattle. That wouldn't be much. Uh, and how much would it take, he said, eh, to what my cloak might cover. And now you know yourself what a cloak will look like when it's wet and be dragging, hanging down narrow. And she took it off. Oh, she said. Spread it out there in the ground and we'll see. And she did. Well, she did. The cloak started spreading out and out and out and out and out. And your man, he was there uh, with his mouth open. <laughs> and he couldn't talk. <laughs> and at that minute, this old hag of a woman, she came the way, an old kayak. And she said, <laughs> she said, well, well, if this goes on, there'll never again be a rent paid in Ireland. She said, <laughs> and the minute, the minute she said it, the cloak stopped spreading. But by then, it had spread to the full extent of the colour of Kildare. And that's the reason why there has never been rent paid since on the colour of Kildare. Except, wouldn't you know, there was some blackguard to spoil a little bit of it. The English government, with their <laughs> old army camp there, the colour camp. And of course, the Irish government, they learned from them. Because when the English left, the Irish government took it over. And they had it to this very day. Mm -hmm. Old habits die very hard, bad habits. So no. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So she was generous and she was uh, a little fond bit magic, our Bridget. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and fond of cattle. And fond of cattle, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you think, Eddie, um, that she inspired other women? Like, I know Biddy Early is down there in Clare near Ye. Do, you know, had she an influence on them, do you think? I don't think so, because, you see, we know very little about, about St. Bridget, and you know the reason why. No. At the time of St. Bridget, women, according to old ancient Irish law, weren't allowed to own land. Huh. Women weren't allowed to own land. And there were convents of women at that time. But the reason we all know nothing about them is a man in a family or a chieftain might give land to an abbess the chief the nun of a convent like that mm -hmm. for a lifetime only, except in very rare occasions, like St. Bridget. She was an exceptional woman. But when the abbess died, the land would go back again to the chief uh, uh, man of the family who had given it to her. Mm. And, the, and the nuns would scatter. Wow. That's why, that's why we hear so rarely about nuns in the mm -hmm. early Christian church in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Whereas Bridget was kind of an abbess in her own right, and so she was what? able to, yeah. Yes. God, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And um, did you ever hear of her performing miracles in terms of healing people? I, I think she might be sometimes associated with um, childbirth, maybe, or things like that. Did you ever yes, hear any of those ones? I never heard any of those stories. Mm -hmm. And you're right, she is uh, associated with that. And of mm -hmm. course, she was a preacher. Uh, she's associated with um, queens. Oh. Mm -hmm. Queens, because of course, she's noted to have uh, travelled around in a chariot. Mm -hmm. and, there are, and there are places where on her feast day, St. Bridget's Day, there are certain parishes where all queens and queened work stopped. For example, in the parish of Liscannor, 
where St. Bridget's Well is in West Clare, mm -hmm. no wheel work was done on that day. Like, for example, spinning wheels and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. No. And I'd say it might have been related to that somehow. Yeah. Not yeah. true. And of course, women would have benefited from that break, maybe, because they were probably the spinners, yes. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about, um, <clears throat> I mean, we're skipping forward, but if we talk about women that were healers or that were uh, kind of magic, you know, who else, who, oh, who were early. the main stories you heard about? Well, Biddy Early is the main woman. Yeah. Uh, because uh, she lived from 1798 to 1874. And uh, Biddy, she lived here in Clare, down in Fakey, which is only 12 miles from where I live here. And there's no doubt in, in the latest edition of my book, I found her death cert finally. Because lots of people didn't believe, ah, they thought she's only a, she's only a, a legend. But no, I found her death set as she died on the 23rd of April, 1874. And there's no doubt about it, maybe, uh, she had a cure. She was a herbalist, mm -hmm. but she was more. Maybe she frightened people mm -hmm. because you could walk 30 miles to her cottage. And when you'd arrive at the door, she'd know you. She'd know where you came from, she'd know your name, she'd know what was wrong with you. She frightened the living life out of people. Wouldn't you be frightened? Wouldn't I be frightened if she knew all those things about you? Um, no, she didn't get on with the clergy naturally. She didn't get on with the police because they accused her of having a she been, which was true because, you see, she dealt with poor people mainly who couldn't afford the doctor. and. She didn't take money, she didn't take payment, because, you see, any real healer, even to this very day, doesn't accept money mm -hmm. or payment. And you'd always know a quack uh, by if they, if they charge and not the real thing. Hmm. You can pay them mm -hmm. what, what you wish, but if they have a fee, they're not the real thing. Mm -hmm. That has always been accepted in Ireland. Mm -hmm. There's a, a list of payments, avoid them, <laughs> avoid them. And BD never charged. Now, mm -hmm. people paid her, of course, because if she could cure you, well, it was only gratitude. You got her something. It might have been a half a dozen eggs, or most people brought her a bottle of pussy. <laughs> uh, for your American viewers, that would be moonshine. Yeah. And by, um, by, Bringing that, of course, they were doing double duty because they were paying her and they were cheating the government. And, uh, well, it was the English government. So they were doing their national duty as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Ireland was under English rule at the time. So patriotic duty by cheating the English government. <laughs> and, um, I heard that, I mean, I grew up with hearing stories about Biddy Early. The big one, of course, in my lifetime was that she had cursed the Clare hurling team. No. But is that a lie? <laughs> it couldn't be true for the simple reason that Biddy died in 1874. Before the GAA, the GAA was founded. The GAA wasn't founded until 1884. Yeah. So and yet the, they didn't win until the year that the curse would supposedly have been lifted. Wasn't that funny? I never heard that the cost was lifted. <laughs> I think they won in the 90s, and that would have kind of been around the time, but I, oh, I don't know. That was... A, no, no, uh, they won in 1914. Oh, yeah, but didn't they not win then again for decades? But as you said, she was already dead, so we can't blame Biddy Early uh, for that. No, 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 they were Biddy just bad Early. players. No, no, it was... It <laughs> was uh, there was a different story to it. Oh, tell me, story. okay. A different story was that in 1914, what way would you travel to Dublin? You, either tra you, you could either go by train or not at all, basically, mm -hmm. or you could walk or go by horse and cat. Mm -hmm. so train was the obvious thing. And the story I heard was that on the morning that they were going to Dublin for the match, mm -hmm. there was a direct way, you see, uh, you could go from Ennis 
and all the little stations all along, most of which are closed now. But there was a station that the in Cratlow, which is the next station, the Six Mile Bridge, and then Limerick. And some of the players were from that area, and they wanted to get mass that morning because there might be a chance, of course, of getting it again. So what they did was they went to mass in Cratlow Station or, or Cratlow Church, which is very near the station. And they left their gear at the church door, their tugs, their hoddlies, their, their all the rest of it, so that when they hear the train coming, they could grab their gear and run. Mm-hmm. Of course, the steam train at the time, they all puff, 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 puff. And if it was today, they would hear nothing. But, you know, because the, 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 the G's and to be gone like that. But in any case, they were there at the door and... In those days also, to the Latin Mass, Nominate Patris, the Filiid, Spiritual Saint, the Amen, and the priest was facing in towards the altar. Mm-hmm. And you remember, there was only a few times that the priest faced the congregation, and one of those times was at the Holster. elevation. Yeah. At the elevation. And as bad look would have it, that was the time that they had the train coming. When the uh, elevation was, the priest had just turned around from the elevation of the host and the boys, they had to make a quick choice. They had to make a quick choice to run for it or they missed the train. And of course, out the door with them, grab their gear and ran, but not before the priest said, come back, come back. And of course they couldn't, or they didn't. But he shouted after them. He knew where they were going. But he said, you'll win today, he said, but you'll never again win, he said, until the next year is gone. And they didn't. Oh, never again won a game until the last of that team was dead. Yeah. That is true that there was a massive gap. Priests had very powerful curses, hadn't they, in Irish society, well, apparently? Oh, well, yeah. God almighty, it was a well-known thing. The priest curse was... Mm. Uh, a feared thing. Mm-hmm. Now, on the other side, the priest's blessing was also mm-hmm. a, a looked after thing. You know, it was, it was either one extreme or the other. Mm-hmm. The priest's blessing was a great thing on the open a priest because people were afraid of And even to this day, even though priests don't, don't, uh, but a priest because was not a, I know a village, I know mm-hmm. a village where a terrible thing happened and a priest cost it. And that village is empty today. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that's no joke. I'm not joking there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's kind of power in those, you know, words, I suppose, or in the, the position they have in society, kind of, yeah. And then I know I read your book, um, <clears throat> Meeting the Other People, or Meeting the Other um, Crowd. Yeah, you know, if, if a fairy, if you got trapped in the fairy fort or, you know, it, it was often priests that could save people or, or they'd walk them. If somebody was afraid to be out on Halloween night, a priest would maybe be able to save you, kind of. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the thing about the, the fairies, uh, they make all those people profess not to call them the fairies. No, they're, yeah. they're, they're called or the good people or Mabini Ushu or Bonach Mik or Mabini Elia. Out of respect. Um, the people, people like to keep them at a little bit of a distance. You know, mind your own business and they'll mind theirs. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people yet that would be like that. And I would be the same. I wouldn't interfere with a fault. And I wouldn't care who might laugh at me or anything else. Because it's one thing to laugh. But it's another thing to bring on yourself something that you don't want and that you might regret later. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. Not far from us here is the, uh, the motorway, the N18. It's only been 10 years. Uh, that's the one where the, the fairy bush was further down. Mm-hmm. The hook further north. The very same motorway. They kept the fault when they were building it. If you did that, or I did that, we'd be in jail. But the, the road builders can do what they like when they're building. And they didn't have to do it, but they did it stupidly. And since then, 
there have been about 60 accidents at that spot. Now, why? If there was one or two or three or four, I'd say, all right, coincidence. Accidents happen. And sometimes on a motorway, way, there are bad weather or bad drivers or speed, you know, things like this. But when there's so many accidents after accident after accident at a particular spot where a stupid thing like that has been done, where a fairy fault has been interfered with, then there's something wrong. There's more, that's more than coincidence. You ask yourself, why? I know why. I know why. <laughs> the, I, I said it to the engineers, in, in fact. And you know the stupid answer they gave me? <laughs> There's a mini climb at the, uh, at the spot. <laughs> There's a mini, a mini climb. climb. A mini climb. That's their stupid answer. Now they laugh at me when I say, it might be the fair. Mm -hmm. And they give me a stupid answer. Oh, it's a mini climb. And they expect me to keep a straight face. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And Eddie, so the other crowd, we'll call them, are they kind of a parallel, you know, species to us? Or what is the origin? I know people say they're from the Tuha de Danon, or they, you know, they were kind of driven underground. What exactly are they? There's many stories. Mm. I, it's too long to go into here, but there's a logic to all of the stories, one leading to another. And that book, as you mentioned there, meeting the other crowd, mm -hmm. which I, as you, if you read it, you'll see, I let the people tell their own stories. Yeah. Uh, I fill in the gaps in between. I don't take sides one way or another. I let the people tell their own stories. And I, well, I hope it explains itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, as I said, it's too long a story to, to go into here. You know, yeah. uh, we, I must get copies of the book for the shop so you can buy it to find out. But I was hoping, yeah, I knew there wouldn't be a simple answer. <laughs> but you would advise people, as you said, to just leave them alone. Like we grew up near a fairy fort and we weren't allowed on it. But other people then had versions that you could go in it, but you couldn't pick, you know, any flowers or don't touch anything like but oh, we yeah, weren't leaving I mean. into it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go in it, look around, and I go in there, I photograph them and all the rest of it. But let me just tell you an interesting thing now. I live here near us, and the farmer is very obliging. He always let me bring visitors there because it's near the road and it's very photogenic, we'll say, because it's on the horizon and you get a lovely photo of it. But of late, last year, I took a group of Swedish people. They wanted to see it and they rang me to you know, did I, did I know of any fort nearby? And I said, I did. And I asked the farmer because I would always inquire from him, even though he told me I can go in there any time I like. But it's only manly to inquire. So I did. No problem. I went in there with them. There were four or five of them there. And we just around. They took some photos. They were very interested people and interesting people. But we saw what we saw, and we were coming away, and one of them stopped, and he looked back, and he said, they are being watched, <laughs> in his Swedish accent, they are being watched. Big man, big man. And uh, it was only afterwards I found out he was one of the Swedish equivalent of, we say, the parachutes regiment, the SAS, or the SEALs, we say, in America. You know, the, the elite uh, army crowd, be, 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 who wouldn't be afraid of anything, but, but they are being watched. Uh, he knew, he knew there was something uncomfortable about this place. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't afraid, but he, he he, he sensed something. And something not right about this place. Mm -hmm. No, we kept going, we kept going, and that was all about it. But I was, I was taken by that. Mm. This man, you wouldn't expect that from him. He was no hippie or any kind of nonsense stuff like this. 
he was a very practical kind of guy who looked oh, no, look back where he was. <laughs> and he wasn't talking about the farm or anything like right? that. Yeah. There was nobody there. Um, and so we got off the subject of bit early before you had a chance to tell us the story about her. <laughs> well, she was married four times, mm. four times, and uh, all her husbands died before her. Uh, there was nothing, there was nothing of any suspicion in that. Uh, I think that I think they drank themselves to death because the house was always full of drink. You see. And had a drink, free drink, <laughs> and you see a lot of it would have been rot gut. Uh, you know, is rot gut, just like moonshine, and uh, they don't know what you're drinking with that stuff. So uh, I found the death such of one of her husbands as well. Now, the thing about it also is one of those husbands was suspected of being involved in the death of one of the local landlords. Now, it was never proved against him, but uh, I would think he might have been. Because remember, the, the local, that local landlord threatened to evict pity and, and the husband. And some of the local tenants, he was a bit of an idiot of a landlord. He was a he was an old old man in Limerick who bought the land. And he came out there who he, he thought he could do as he pleased. Mm -hmm. At that time in Ireland, he couldn't. There were a lot of tough men. A lot of tough men. And remember there was a lot of moonlighters, a lot of fellows who at night and I was in the place basically where that fellow was. And it was a lonesome spot. The police had warned him, don't go there alone. And he insisted he would. They cut the head off him. Wow. They, they run the house over his head. And when he tried to get out the window, they, they cut the head off him with a sign. So I mean, there were rough times. There were tough, rough times in agrarian disputes that time. So. That's what Ireland had been reduced to, you see, by landlordism and high rents and all the rest of it. It was a lawless, lawless country in the middle even of the 19th century. Hmm. And um, so she didn't kill any of her husbands, which was good. Oh, and I heard she used to always have a little blue bottle. Is that true? She had a bottle, but I believe the bottle was only a crop. Oh. The power was in herself. And you see, as I said to you, if you came to her door and she knew everything about you, it, the collapse was right. The bottle was there, to, I think, to get people to think, ah, well, if it is, if it is in the bottle, she's getting her, from the bottle, she's getting her power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be as so frightened. Mm -hmm. But I think the bottle was just a kind of a prop to keep people from getting too frightened. And then you see, she'd bring you in and give you uh, a bottle full of water. The water was from the well down at the the, the, the Boreen, the little the passageway. And the well is still there. And it's an amazing thing when you come to that well down there at the bottom of the little plot of ground, which, by the way, is for sale now. I noticed nobody has bought it, though. <laughs> it's for sale for the last four or five years, but nobody has bought a plot of ground. And there is the well, and when you think of all the thousands and thousands of people who got water out of that well and got a clue, incredible. Yeah, wow, incredible. yeah. yeah. Um, and so Biddy mostly kind of worked for good. I know, um, I forget her name now, the McMahon woman that is in your book, Defiant Irish Women. She was maybe a different kind of a character, was she, that read... I think that's my book, Defiant Irish Women. Yeah, it Women. is your, yeah, your book, Defiant Irish Women. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, you know, who was the McMahon woman in that? She she was not as maybe good as Biddy Early. <laughs> um, there is old Maura Rua McMahon. Maura Rua, yeah. Mm -hmm. Rua. When mm -hmm. Maura Rua lived away back in the 17th century. Mm. 
Marunua, well, Marunua was tough. Mm. Marunua managed to get the better of the Crom Williams. Oh. Uh, now that took some doing to hold on to her land. Mm. But it has to be done. Mm. Uh, and she, she married a fellow called Cornet, which was our anchor, Cooper, uh, in order to hold on to them in a castle. But <clears throat> some people say, poor old Cooper, he was having a shave one morning and uh, the razor slipped. Uh, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Accidents happened. Other people say he slipped from on top of the castle and he was a bone looking over all his new gotten land. He slipped and said to his death. Anyway, he ended up very, very dead. And, uh, you know, father, she went down and looked for a new husband and said to Ayrton, General Ayrton, you know, the Cromwell left after him to manage all the land and said, why the hell are you giving me these softies? Give me a real husband. Yeah, give me a real man. You know, but, uh, she got another husband after that, but I have still warned her, no, look, this is the last one you're getting. Mind him. Mind him. And uh, they said that it, uh, she did it. She minded him on condition that, on condition that. He was nice and quiet. <laughs> he did. Seemingly, he was. He was. Uh, got on for a while. For a while. But he didn't live too long. Uh, finally, she married a fellow called Neelan, Neelan, uh, an Irish name, and she outlived them, but she met a bad end. Oh. She met a bad end. She was going in by Carnelly House, that's the other side of Venice, beautiful house, big house that was built there later. Uh, there was a smaller house there before that, and she was coming back from a hunt and going in there on a beautiful white stallion. And whatever way the stallion railed, uh, there was a branch of a tree, and she was thrown back and caught in the branch of the tree. And when the rest of the hunt came up, there she was, swinging, 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 after all her adventures and the so many husbands she had put behind her. That's the end she was caught. Mm. Or her past and her adventures caught up with her so simply, so yeah. simply. But she defied them all. She mm. defied all the Cromwellians when so many men didn't. Right. And isn't she supposed to haunt that castle still? Do you believe that? or I had don't you... believe it. I don't believe it. No, I do not. Do you believe, believe in ghosts, Eddie, in general? or? I tell you, there are places that I would not walk comfortably at night, comfortably, alone. And do you know what I do believe? And I don't know whether so many of your uh, listeners, or at least some of your listeners, might might say, you know, could that be true or not? Something holy, like a crucifix, or holy water, holy water, they say, is effective against something. But that's the reason why so many of the old people carried a crucifix. It wasn't for decoration. It was not for decoration. Because remember, there are seven things that the fairies are afraid of. Now, ghosts and the fairies, there's, there's an intermix there that many people get mixed up in. But the ghosts, the ghosts and the fairies, that can be put from you by, by holy things. And the fairies are afraid of seven different things. Something holy. And that could be holy water, or it could be a crucifix, or a scapular, or whatever. And a ghost is the same. And something holy. Something dirty. The fairies are very keen. Very keen. And I remember one old man above in uh, North Clare telling me a very funny story. Funny and not funny at the same time, because it gives you a glimpse into a very old, old way of belief. He said to me that up until about the age of 10 years, his grandmother would never let him out come the evening time without doing two things. She would always make the sign of the cross, something holy, with piss. New lines. 
on his father. Something holy, something dirty, to give him double protection against the bad thing, as he said. The bad thing being maybe a ghost, maybe the fairy. Mm -hmm. So something holy, something dirty, something red. Right. Fairies are afraid of the color of blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because they have no red blood in them. The fairies' blood is greenish. Because they're not human, they have no red blood in them. And that's the reason why very often when a farmer would be going to a fair, just in case the fairies might interfere with his cattle, he would tie a red ribbon onto the cow's horns or tail. Mm -hmm. Something red. Iron or steel. Mm -hmm. The fairies wouldn't come near you if there was iron or steel involved. And the best thing in that line to ca carry with you was a black-handed knife. Just have it. Not to attack them, just to have it. And I wouldn't come near you. Iron or steel. Salt. Fire. Mm -hmm. Or if you have none of those, six. Run. Run for flowing water. Mm -hmm. I can't cross through. I can't cross flowing water. Mm -hmm. Those are the seven things. Okay. Now, I remember an old man in this very parish telling me there was one particular night. He was coming home from a game of cards in the pond up here. And there were these two men with him because the game that they are on here is called the old game. They played three and three and three, nine players. And they were going home. Three had gone back way, three had gone this way, and these three men were going down that road here. And they all sat together, these three, but on this particular night, for whatever reason, his two companions, they totally left at the cross below here for Stansel Hill, you know, the famous fair of Stansel Hill, Mm -hmm. They were going that way. Unusual, but look, that was their own business. And he was going for the last quarter of a mile on his own. They were walking. They were walking that time. But that was not been. Everybody was walking. They're all dead since I knew them when I came here 14 years ago. They were alive, but they're all dead since they were the older generation. But there were four pubs here that time. Mm -hmm. There's only one pub here now. And all the country is gone, country places have gone to nothing. No, no, no. But in any case, uh, he had to walk the last quarter of a mile alone. But that, you know, the same man was afraid of nothing. That man had been all over the country walking. But there was a fort in his way. No, so the same man, he'd be cautious about a fort, you know, all the same, especially when he had no company. And what he did was, <laughs> he told it to me himself, you know, he, he wasn't afraid to admit it. When he came for the fort, he uh, looked around him and he went to the other side of the road. And to the moon at night, he could see very clearly what he was doing. And he went into the field at the other side of the road and he looked around him and there was cattle in the field. And he looked for a cow dog. And like a, he rubbed his hand in the cow dung, mm. the cow shit, the cow shit, and out he, out he came in, he left, and on he came past the fort. Mm. And he had the cow dung in his hand, as he now feared it, and he just did, and on, on he came home. Now, he couldn't very well go in home, because his wife would be up and waiting for him, that I was of a cup of tea before that was made. And he couldn't very well go in, he had to cover the cow dung. Yes, she'd ask him what kind of a very gay was that. <laughs> so he went to the yard anywhere and you know there'd be no battle for the rain in the shed. And you know, he went for the battle and washed his hands there and dried it over his arm and in he went. His wife did not I didn't have to sleep with me today. That was that. But he told me that he was like, Yes, he was safe, passing the fort by his hand and covered with color. Something dark. Mm -hmm. Covered him. Well, he believed in it. It was a common belief. Something holy, something dark, something red, iron, or steel, or fire, or running water. Mm -hmm. Well, at least there's protection, you know, <laughs> against them, which is good. Um, oh, yeah. So, 
I suppose no story from an Irish Shanaki about women in Ireland would be complete without hearing about the Banshee. Will you be able to tell us something about the Banshee? Down the very same road. <laughs> road here. And the man across his dead again. They must be pretty little. Nice man, great man for playing cards and playing. He used to play the small box out of the country. Mm -hmm. He was going to the he was going to the fair of Goth one morning, early, driving cattle, and that was ten miles. You know, that's a bit of a walk, a good big distances. But he was walking to the fair of Goth with a couple of cattle in the month of November. And he was coming there at Dumbanus. That's the town land. And he had this almighty cry, crying. And the cat started to get nervous and he had trouble controlling them. And did you know he wouldn't be a man to, to I think, talk nonsense. But especially about a thing like that. But anyway, he, he managed to get them going in the way he wanted them to do. And he got past the place and kept going. But it was the kind of cry he said that he'd give you the the, the, the hair on the back of your head. Would would he didn't feel right because country people they know the difference between a hair crying and a fox crying. And they know of the two nearest crimes to what the banshee is supposed to be like. A hare and a fox, they can be very lonesome cries, not like a domestic animal at all, but anywhere on him. There was no cry, well, when he was coming home. But he was waiting in one room. I'm sure you know, I'm sure you know. I'm already there. I'm already there. Oh. Oh. From that same place, those funds in my mind could take. Mm -hmm. uh, so, does she always appear before the death? You know, no, in appear. certain families? Yeah. Not appear so much as is held. Heard, okay, held. yeah. Well, can appear, can appear. And when she does appear, mostly, mostly as a tall, tall, thin, grey haired woman. Mm. Mostly. Mm -hmm. That's as I have heard it. Maybe mm -hmm. other people have heard it. it is, it's tall. And sometimes combing her hair. Combing yeah. her hair. My God, yeah. And so, did you grow up with hearing those kinds of stories in Brosna too? Or did it come later? Yeah. My uncle, my father, no. My uncle, yes. My uncle was very good. And I, I recorded a good bit of him, but he was a man for more funny stories. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that. Uh, mainly stories against the clergy. <laughs> yes. And, and, those and, too. <laughs> and, and he was and he was a parish clerk. Oh God. <laughs> so he knew yeah. it all. Yeah. Well and the kind of stories that would never insult. Priests used yeah. to enjoy them. Priests yeah. used to enjoy them. They were very, very funny stories. He was an amazing funny man. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle Bill. And Eddie, did you used to do, we'll call it like the Rambling House or Bohan Theoct, would you go to a different house, you know, no. one night a week or something? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. no, no. There was, uh, that was side out. That was side yeah. out. Even and, when in your days. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And I'm very, very sorry to say that there's only one house left now in this parish mm -hmm. here uh, now that I can go to and uh, listen and go to the, the old man that's there, and he's 91. And when he's wow. dead, that's it. Mm -hmm. Gone. Oh Gone. Yeah. Well, you know, you've done great work to, to collect all of the stories all these years. And we there's, um, I think it's so important. We say it all the time, you know, or we used to at home. We had a neighbor next door who was very elderly, you know, and um, he told us one time the first time he got a pair of shoes was the day he made his confirmation and that oh, yeah. 
you know, they were hobnail boots, like big old boots. And, you know, they got him big enough, I suppose, that he had them for a few years. But he wanted to hear the sound of the shoes on ground. And so he walked the mile in and there was a church with the convent uh, back in Lestole in Greenville. And he walked up and down the nave of the church to hear the shoes, you know, clipping and clapping. And eventually one of the nuns came out to him and said, listen, young fella, like, I'm delighted you've got shoes. But if you ever go home, you're giving us a headache. <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah. and he had all these little stories about kind of the poverty you know he used to walk to Valley Bunyan for a day's work in the bog that was nine miles away and then he'd do a day's work and walk nine miles home um okay. you know so and we always said we should record him because when he's gone the stories will be gone and sure you know we never did record him and so you know thank god we got the few out of him that we remember but it's a pity that we didn't record more you know I know there are so many people who keep promising and then there's no time like no time. Now. Yeah, because yeah. if we don't do it now, all of a sudden, gone. Mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. My uh, my aunt died last July, and oh. she was 101. 101. What? But she what was the last of all. Mm -hmm. Well, she was the last of my father's family, but I had recorded quite a bit from her. And oh, she told a lovely story about when she was a young child. She was born the year the Black and Tans came, mm -hmm. 1920. And she told a story that on that year, she was sick mm. uh, in Mount, Mount Collins, because that's where they were from, my father of now. And you know, Mount Collins is just across the, the wall, that's from Ross now, mm -hmm. in County Limbrick. And she was sick. And my grandfather, which I only found out from her, I didn't know it, he was in charge of the paperwork for the local uh, Sinn Féin. And I suppose the reason being, you see, is that being a harness maker, he had to be a good at figures. You know, when a lot of people weren't, mm -hmm. to, keep his own, to keep his own accounts. And he had these accounts in the house, which was a dangerous thing. Now, on a particular evening, the Thames raided with their crossly tenders, but they were, they were held coming. Now, of course, they would be held coming because what motorised traffic was there at that time. Mm -hmm. But they were held coming. Uh, and where, where would they put this stuff? They put them under the child who was sick. They put them under the child's mattress, my aunt Nora. And the tents must be anywhere. The tents must be in the the house. And look at it, look at it. There was the, the officer in charge. They were going to tumble the child out on the floor, like they tumbled every other bed out on the floor, searching. And the officer in charge, no, he said, no, the child is sick. And she always thought the poor, you know, maybe the man had a young family at home himself. She was always very thankful for that officer, that at least some of them were human, she said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the same man had, wherever he was from, maybe he had a family himself. Mm -hmm. But he said, if those papers were found, the house would have been burned. Mm -hmm. my, gra my grandfather, he escaped out the window and up a little, a little valley under the briars and all the rest of him. He wasn't caught. Mm -hmm. But nothing was found. But the black and tans went back then to the cross in Mount Collins and they wouldn't down the hall. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm delighted you have your aunt's story. I'm just going to see if anybody has any questions there that are online with us that they could um, ask or, or make a comment. Rose has just texted to say thank you. She was delighted to hear about the Banshee. And um, But if anyone has any questions for Eddie or some comments, uh, I'm sure he'll love to take them. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, they might all be kind of shy too. <laughs> and, <that> be shy? <laughs> and you know, I think what you were saying earlier on too about the Americans being a good audience, of course, a lot of them would have grown up, our crowd, especially with Irish, maybe nanas or, or granddads or, you know, and so they, they would come from a storytelling tradition too, which is good. You know, a lot of them, this is very familiar to them kind of, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. So you've no questions or comments, anybody? All... Well, I have, I have been in 40 of the 50 
states. States, oh my God. Yeah. And I have found always the American people have been very kind to me. Mm -hmm. But I have almost given up uh, going to America because I'm 71. Mm -hmm. And America is a very big country. Mm -hmm. And you come back from America, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Right. it's big, and there's a lot to do, and there's a lot coming at you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, not nothing to do with American people. They're wonderful no. people, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful, hospitable people. But it's a big country, mm -hmm. and it, it takes a lot out of you. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it sadly, does. Yeah, I've always said that I can understand why pop groups go on drugs. <laughs> Yes, to keep to keep going. Yeah, to keep going. Yeah. Well, you would need sometimes a bit of a boost, I'd say. <laughs> and, uh, that that and loneliness from mm -hmm. being away from home. Mm -hmm. uh, genuinely, genuinely, it's not always just for the high and the rest. It is to keep going mm -hmm. because I tell you, it's no it's no fun being on stage all the time. Money doesn't make up for that. No. Money does not make a sense. Mm -hmm. And and the tax man takes most of it anyway. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That is true. And you know, I think you're right, your performance can be very draining sometimes. You know, you're you're switched on and you have to Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, actually, while we talk about that for a second, you never had to immigrate for a while, did you? Back in when you were younger, like were you always able to stay? You know the way John B had to work in England for a while and no, you were always at home. home. Yeah. And I, I, I tell you, my mother died when I, when I, at the age of 49. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Yes, my mother. Yeah, and thanks be to God. My father, you know, at an age back there in the 1960s, uh, when it wasn't fashionable for fathers to rear families, mm -hmm. uh, he raised three of us, put us all through college. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, the three of us were teachers. Mm -hmm. Myself, my brother, my sister, we all were teachers. And we we can thank him for that. Mm -hmm. We can thank him for that, and we always do. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it was a big thing for him to do mm -hmm. uh, as, as a harmless maker, and he died very young as well. You know, Crohn's mm -hmm. disease. Oh, he, he, she was only she was only forty nine, and he was only sixty two or three. Mm -hmm. So I mean, very young. There yeah. were tough, tough times in Ireland. They were, yeah. Uh, and as you say, it was unusual to go to college. You know, if your father was a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher, you might go. But if you weren't already oh, in that, it was difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. And I tell you, I saw it in college. I saw mm -hmm. it in college where you had the engineering faculty and the medical faculty and all of those guys. And they're spending money playing poker while we scrape clothes. Mm -hmm. I, I did, and I didn't appreciate it, and I can still see my own children, uh, two or three of them have PhDs. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they worked, they worked, and I don't think my, uh, there's a couple who have no value on these guys that they see, not even coming up for lectures. Mm -hmm. and, they're, they're still, and they're still doing it in mm -hmm. Ireland. Uh, I, I do believe today that anybody who doesn't take the opportunities in college that are given to them. Get out. There's plenty of people trying to get into college. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be allowed to be there. Mm -hmm. they be, there are plenty of people who want to get into college. If you if you don't take your chances, go. Mm -hmm. I do believe that. Yeah, no, it is true, really. People take things for granted a lot, you know. But you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's if no so one... Long. Tell me, sorry, go ahead. It's not so long, you see, in Ireland. We, we forget easily. It's not so yeah. long in Ireland since we were a miserably poor country. Now there's two and three cars outside every house. Mm -hmm. People take things for granted. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. The memory is short, isn't it? When you think back, like to, you know, my grandfather was one of 14. His wife was one of 11. And, you you know, it was a very different childhood that they had, you know, than, than what I had. And my grandfather was the only one that stayed in Ireland. Everybody else had to emigrate, you know. So, um, yeah. but how, how quickly an we old, forget, you know. An old man, an old man that I recorded or how so much of, not just of the black and tans, but of 
So he was a wonderful man. I, he's dead. He, he, he lived to be 99. Mm. And he was wonderful in the sense that his father was Protestant. He was Catholic. So he saw both sides, uh, most unusually. But he saw the hungry Protestants. Mm. And of course, they were hungry in America too. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dust Bowl and all the rest of it. They were extremely hungry here. Uh, we had not just depression, but we had, well, we had the economic war mm -hmm. with England, which was a very stupid thing. But he told me, because his fa family was a little bit better off than other families, that people were coming to his house, offering to work for no wages. All they wanted was food, food, and they worked for nothing. And his father talked to me. Oh, that was tough. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to have dignity, isn't it, in those circumstances like... Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. well, there you go. Does anybody remember that now? Uh, yeah, exactly. They don't. Mm -hmm. But thanks be to God, I, I can... You know, I have that at least on record. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's good to remember. Oh, absolutely. And you know, the thing is, it kind of was cyclical because it was very bad in the 50s and it was bad again in the 80s for a while, you know, so mm -hmm. people need to be careful, <laughs> like these bubbles burst all the time. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my young lads to save some money. Don't just blow it because that, as you say, bad days will come again, without mm -hmm. a doubt. As you mm -hmm. say, things come along. Mm -hmm, they do. Well, Eddie, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And, you know, as I say, it was a real flashback for me because I remember you coming both to school and to the Shanaki, the Writers' Centre there in Listowel and St. John's. Um, I think you have a fantastic outlook on life and, and the, the longer kind of perspective, you know, that we, we shouldn't just discard the past because we think what we have now is better. And that applies to nature as well as, you know, culture. And I, I think you've been doing amazing work in Ireland. Um, so I'll just make sure that nobody online had a question. Did it, you can type it in or you can unmute yourself. But um, thank you so much. It was a, an unusual celebration for Bridget in a way. But as we said, she, it, she didn't have a massive kind of following down Kerry and Claire, where Eddie and I are from. So uh, we used her as the gateway in to talk about other folk and um, pastoral kind of and, and peasant traditions. So I really appreciate you coming. Um, Sarah Lou was saying thank you for a wonderful evening. And and Rose thanked. So, um, yeah, I think we had a great time. We're back in the museum uh, next week. I forget. God, we just sent out our table of events uh, or our newsletter today. But we have uh, next week a talk about the Civil War, the American soldiers and the opioid crisis and the Civil War on the 8th. And then on the 10th, we have um, she's a curator in the National Gallery in Washington. She's going to talk to us about the 54th Regiment from Massachusetts, which was the first black regiment, because, of course, it's Black History Month as well now. Um, and then the, there's other talks coming. So thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We're delighted mm -hmm. and uh, to have you all. Uh, bad dresses and, and Murphy says so thank you. And this will be available on YouTube and on our Facebook and website. And Eddie, I'll be back in touch with you again. So thank, thank you. you very much. I know it is late there at home. So call us off and Ihawa. Thank you very much for staying in so late with us tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. That's great. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> so take care. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Eddie. Good night. <laughs> exactly. Good night.